Good morning, everybody. How was your week? <laughs> I want to thank God for the opportunity to stand before his people to bring the word. I want to thank PFA for this opportunity also. It is one I take with all humility and trembling. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you because the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding unto the simple. As we come before you, we come with open hearts, open minds. We say minister to us in the name of Jesus. And after now, the grace to be the doers and not just hearers of the word deceiving ourselves, I pray you give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Anoint my lips afresh, Lord. Give me the grace to share your word exactly as you've sent it without doing any damage in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Today I'll be ministering on what I've titled The Pain of Burton. The Pain of Burton. The guy should not you know who, because I can see some expressions. The Pain of Burton. When I was going to have my first daughter, I remember she was born on a Tuesday. So the Sunday before that, I was in church and I was talking to a friend after service. And he said, when did the doctor even say this baby is due? When exactly are you supposed to give birth? And I said, today. He said, he, he jumped back. I don't know, maybe he thought that that's how babies just used to fall, that the baby would just drop in the middle of that conversation. He, he was just really alarmed. But I'm here to announce that that is not how it happens. Babies just don't drop suddenly like that. There is a process to it. Let's go to the book of Isaiah 66, verses 7 and 8. Isaiah 66, 7 to 8. Okay, I'm just going to start reading it. It says, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? This is to let us know that that's an anomaly, that that is not how it happens. That people don't just give birth before the pain comes. Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Some translations say, as soon as Zion traveled, she gave birth to her child. I just want us to know that before any birthing, there is a traveling. Before any birthing, there is a traveling, which means there are good pains. The kind of pain that leads to delivery of something special is a good kind of pain. You see, nobody ever tries to stop a woman when she's going into labor. Have you ever seen anybody saying, no, no, she will experience pain, let's stop her, let her not go into labor. Because they know the end result of that labor. So the focus is always on what will come after the pain. John 16, 21 says, when a woman is in labor, she is in anguish because her hour has arrived. John 16, 21. She is in anguish because her hour has arrived, but when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the pain because of her joy that a child has been born into the world. Hallelujah. You see, one of the things I've noticed is that from Nature and the natural works of God in life, we can actually pick some lessons. For example, now we see that the sun and the rain shines and falls on everybody, irrespective of who you are, without any discrimination. And you see Jesus himself pointed to that, that by that we should learn to love everyone. No discrimination. Some are easier to love than some, but we should love everyone. Another one that we can look at is planting and the way plants go, seed and harvest. By this, we understand that it's not the same day you start putting effort that you expect to, to just blow, to just become. That's another lesson we learn from nature. And today we are going to learn from the process of birthing and understand that before any birthing, there's pain. Stay with me, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. So today I want to speak to everyone who has a vision, everyone with a goal, everyone with a purpose. 
everyone who has ever dreamt of becoming or creating something, this message is for you today. If you have a purpose you've received from God, God has called you to teach believers to become better Christians. He has called you into cyber security. He has called you to build a company. He has called you into data analysis. Whatever it is that burns in your heart, that has to come to pass, that drives you, that you want to become a reality, that purpose, before you can get to the manifestation, there's a process. There's a process. But someone will say, why am I now emphasizing pain, pain, pain? It's because it's just, it's just the way of life. It's just the way of life. Before you can bet anything, there are very few important or worthwhile things that you can get in life without some exertion. Good things don't just come, just drop in our laps. It's very rare for it to happen that way. Do we understand what I'm saying, please? Okay. So, but why does God allow us to go through this pain? Someone may ask that. After all, God loves us. Can't he just take away the pain and just make it happen like that? Without the pain. It's because there is a reason for the pain. For every pain that we go through in the betting of purpose, there is a reason. And I'm going to get to the reason in a bit, but before we even get to the reason for the pain, let's discuss those pains. What are the pains that somebody who wants to bet purpose, somebody who is pursuing destiny, someone who has a dream, a vision burning in their heart, what are the pains that you are likely to go through before that vision becomes a reality? And I'm going to use our best example, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no better example than that. Because Jesus bettered the greatest purpose of all time. The salvation of mankind. The reconciliation of man to God. It's because Jesus fulfilled this purpose that we are even gathered here today. That we are called church. You see, if Jesus did not fulfill purpose, the only people you can call brother and sister are your mother's children. They won't be brethren. They won't be this kind of fellowship. Can we just take a minute to celebrate Jesus, to celebrate his victory? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Did Jesus go through pain in the burden of purpose? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that one. But we are going to go through his pain and see how it relates to us today in the burden of our own vision and purpose. For this, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, I'm going to read from 36 to 46. Just stay with me. Are we there? I apologize for the lack of slides. It is completely my fault. Sorry. Next time, I will send it to the... <laughs> I will send my notes to the slide maker. Apologies. Okay, we are there. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Them, in this sentence, is the disciples, as we know. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. We can see, we are already seeing the pains he's going through. Stay here and watch with me. And then he went a little farther and fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. From these verses, I, I took the time to read it because I would just like to pick some of the pains that Jesus experienced from the verses I've read. And the first one I want to speak to is the pain of offense. The pain of offense. You see, it is impossible to pursue purpose alone. You cannot bet a vision alone. You need people. 
It is just impossible to say, God gave me this vision, I'm going to achieve it solely on my own, by myself, in myself. It is not doable. Relating with people, working with people is unavoidable. But the interesting thing is that working with people is also the sure way to open yourself up to offenses. Because, hey God, have you met people? <laughs> working with people is a sure way to open yourself to hearts, disappointments, betrayals, and all sorts of offenses. Now, let's take a look at this now. Verse 38. Jesus spoke to people that he counted as friends. He didn't take all the disciples, though. These are the inner caucus. And then he told them something as heavy as my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Pray with me. They slept. No, really. Can you just imagine that? Will you not be offended? And if you even want to talk about this one, the, own, the gravity of their own is still little. Let's talk about Brother Judas. So it, it's just the pain of offense has to come. As you are pursuing purpose, sometimes you're even just minding your own business, just facing what God said you should do. They will just bring their own to your lane. It is unavoidable. The pain of offense, unavoidable. Luke 17, 1 says it is impossible, but that offenses will come. You just have to know that offenses will come. John 2, 23 to 25. It speaks to some men, some people believing in Jesus after they've seen signs and wonders. And I like what the Bible says. It said Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knows all men and he knew what is in man. This is just a soft reminder to you to just know that just take, just take it philosophically. Anything that anybody does, just be like, okay, so way forward now. Just, just take it like that. There is no way you'll be pursuing purpose and destiny. You'll be relating with human beings and offenses will not come. There's, it's just no way. And you see, you cannot, you cannot handle it by blocking and canceling. Oh, so this one, goof, I block him. This one, cancel you. How many? <laughs> How many people will you block? How many people will you cancel? The pain of offense. The second pain I would like to discuss that everybody who is serious about purpose and destiny, you have somewhere you are going, you have something in your heart. The second pain that we have to endure is the pain of prayer. I know many people don't really like to hear this, but you see, you have to pray. There is no, there yet remains no shortcut whatsoever to prayer. You have a vision, you have a purpose, you have something you are chasing, you have to pray. Scripture tells us to pray without season. The whole point of this going to get money by Jesus was to pray. And beyond that, you know Jesus prays. If Jesus prays, please, what is our own excuse? If Jesus can pray. The pain of prayer is one that we have to go through. No, no vision can just be bettered like that, casually. You have to pray. Now, people will say, but if the vision is God's will for me, and God already knows it is his will, why do I still have to pray? I'll list four reasons why we must pray. We pray because we are saying yes to what God wants to do. By praying, we are saying, God, I agree with you. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. We pray so that we can receive strength and grace for the journey. We just talked about people now. You need grace. You need strength for the journey. That is why we pray. The third reason we pray is because the devil is so committed to making sure that that purpose does not come to pass. So it's not like the purpose just wants to come to pass and it's just going swimmingly. The devil is also doing his own bit. That's another reason why we pray. And we pray to enforce the reality of the finished works of Christ. We know that Jesus already got the victory. But in prayer, we enforce it. That yes, Jesus has done this for me and so it is a reality in my life. That is why we pray. All through scriptures, we see people praying and praying. The pain of prayer is one that anybody with a vision, a purpose, has to go through. You have to pray. You have to pray. You just have to pray. If you're saying that, okay, I, I really don't know I mean, what prayer points, what, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Just be praying in tongues. You are warring a good warfare. Just keep praying in tongues. You are fighting a good warfare. Just keep praying in tongues. I remember one day I was praying in tongues and I'm, I'm giving this example so you understand sometimes the Holy Spirit just takes over. It just took over completely. The prayer was so intense that even me that I was praying, I was getting a little concerned. I was wondering what is happening to me, what is going on. It was like it was not me anymore. 
And I heard it in my spirit, labor pains. So I understood what I was doing. So I cooperated fully. I continued. Continued because you have to pray. You have a vision. You have purpose. The pain of prayer. Unavoidable. Are we together so far? Okay. The third pain that everybody has to go through in the pursuit of purpose, in the fulfillment of vision, is the pain of ownership. The pain of ownership. We see that in Matthew 26, 39. Matthew 26, 39 tells us that Jesus went a little further. You see, when you have a vision, you have a purpose, you have to go a little further. You cannot just afford to do what others are doing. You can't stop at the bare minimum. You see, if everybody, if, if people are around you and they are supporting you to make it, you still have to remember that the vision is yours. It is yours to bet. You have to, you have to own it. You have to take ownership completely. You see, when Jesus saw that they were sleeping, he didn't even bother waking them again because he's the owner of the vision. It is his purpose that is at stake. The book ends at your table. You can't pass it. If anybody is uh, trying to support, oh, wow, how kind they are. It's a kindness for people to be asking you, have you prayed? Have you studied? They are just being kind. You are supposed to take ownership. You are the one that knows what vision demands of you and you are supposed to just go all out for it. Anybody else is just being Aaron and all, supporting your hand. It is you. It is up to you. You are the one that God is going to ask concerning this vision. The pain of ownership. You need to take a moment to just ask yourself, the way I've been doing, am I owning it? This vision that God has given me, am I owning it? You see, there are some things that vision demands. You just have to do it. Let me take you back to the example of the pregnant woman. I, I'm not somebody that likes foods like that. When they said, okay, because of this baby, you have to take food. I was taking food as if my life depended on it. Because it's just irresponsible of me not to do that. Take food, I'll take it. Take this medicine, I'll take it. Take, because I said that I'll choose that I don't want to have that vision. But once you've said that you want to follow this path that God has called you to, you have to own it. You have to step up to that responsibility. You have to take ownership. You, it should not be that people will now be chasing you around. Have you done this? Have you done... Whose vision is it? <laughs> we have to be responsible and take ownership for our vision. I'm currently running an MBA and sometimes I'm tired. I just... I've been to work. I've, I'm, I'm very tired. And maybe my husband has done his own prayer, reading everything, so he's free. He just wants to watch football. I carry my tab and sit beside him and be reading. It's me that is writing him. It's my certificate. It's me. It's me. I have to own it. Once you've decided to pursue this path, you have to own it. The pain of ownership will demand sacrifices from you. You have to give up what other people are not giving up. You have, it's the pain of ownership. It will, it will curtail you. There are things others can do that you just cannot afford. It's the pain of ownership. It's sacrifice. Glory to God. The fourth pain I would like to consider is the pain of aloneness. Aloneness. Isaiah 51 2 says, Look unto Abraham, your father, and to Sarah that bore you, for I have called him alone. 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 You cannot avoid the pain of aloneness. Jesus was in prayer. Alone. When the soldiers were going to arrest, they arrested him. Alone. Ultimately, when he went to the cross, he went. Forget about all you are surrounded by people. You see, there's, there's life itself. There's a quality of aloneness that we don't talk about in life itself. Do you know that? Most of the most important decisions you have to make in life, you do it alone. The decision to give your life to Christ is not a communal decision. It's not that, okay, me and my friends have decided to be born again. That's not how it works. When you receive the Spirit of God, you receive Him alone. Even if you receive Him in a room full of people, it falls on each of us alone. There is a pain of aloneness. When you, when you decide to pursue purpose too, there's a pain of aloneness. You see, nobody can understand what God has told you the way you can. Sometimes you can't even express it to the person closest to you. I cannot understand this vision as much as he does, as much as I love him. I, can, I cannot. He's alone. I'm supporting, but 
alone. And you see, ultimately, we die alone. We stand before God to give account of our life. Let's always remember the pain of aloneness. Aloneness is one you just have to bear. You cannot leave your life decisions, propositions to somebody else to decide, oh, let's decide it communally. You have to remember the pain of aloneness. People will not always understand. You have to bear it. Even in making bad decisions, we are alone. Yes, now, if you decide to get an abortion, for example, it does not matter whether the father of the child, your parents, your friends, everybody pushed you to it. When you get into that theater, you went in alone. 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 The pain of aloneness is one that everybody has to face in betting purpose. We are, we are simply alone. Think about it. We have to face the pain. Excuse me. We have to face the pain of offenses, the pain of prayer, the pain of aloneness. But you see the joy of the believer is that the believer is never truly alone. That's, that's what differentiates the believer from anybody else. Because Jesus has said, Lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. He's the one that has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you see, that is the most important person. If he's with you, wow. Well, aloneness is not so bad then. Jesus is always with us. Jesus is always with us. I just need someone to remember that, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there. The ever-present help. The believer is never truly alone. People-wise, honestly, you are alone. But God is with us. Hallelujah. Let me move on. The next pain that we have to go through is the pain of shame. Sometimes, the pursuit of purpose will shame you. To embarrass you. I'm not joking. Jesus had to do what he did despite the shame. They spat on him, they beat him, they treated him like a criminal. At no point did he say, I'm done with this. Do they know who I am? You don't really have that option if you are going to fulfill purpose. You don't get the option of saying, do they know who I am? I'm walking away from this. The pursuit of purpose is going to take you to make pitches in some people's offices. And just the fact that you went there, they will feel they have the right, they are entitled to speak to every decision in your life. They will wash you down. And guess what? When you are leaving, you still say you're polite. Thank you very much. Because it is what it is. The pain of purpose is why you will, you will just stoop and learn from someone that not only is the person younger, that's not the big deal, but the person is so rude and unkind. But you are the one that knows what you are chasing. So you will just be humble, bearing the shame that these two will pass. The pain of shame. The pain of shame, shame is why others will be doing, maybe everybody in your workplace has a car. You are the only one that doesn't have a car. And they will laugh at you. They will say, for how much we are earning, it's even stingy to himself. They don't know that destiny beckons. They don't understand what you are saving towards. In fact, they've given you a nickname. They call you yellow. But you don't know what it means until someone kindly told you it means yellow boss. But you see, purpose beckons. It's the pain of shame. You will bear it. You just have to bear it the way Jesus did. You don't get to just cut off in the middle and say, I can't take this shame anymore because I, I can't. Then that's, you are just saying goodbye to purpose and destiny fulfillment. I'm sharing these pains so that I know some of us are already going through them. And some of us may still be, maybe you've not seen some of them, so don't worry. When you now see it, <laughs> when you see it, you know that you've been forewarned, you've been prepared. It will not shock you as much as... Hallelujah. The last pain I'd like to discuss is the pain of waiting. It's the pain of waiting. Ah, we don't like that one at all. <laughs> Abraham had to wait for 25 years for Isaac to be born. He was 75 when the promise was given. Isaac was born when he was 100. 25 years of waiting. Do you know how many years David had to wait between the time he was anointed king and when he actually became king? The pain of waiting. <laughs> Unavoidable also. 
But you see, the, the, the most important thing about this pain of waiting is that it is very important how you wait. It's very important how you handle all the pains, but I want to even focus on this waiting. You should not wait in a way that will frustrate everybody around you. Most we all know you are waiting. Patience is waiting gracefully. Just wait. Just wait in a way that you are not a burden to everybody around you. Hallelujah. Now, I promise that I will tell us why we have to bear these pains before I start listening to the pains. That what is the reason behind these pains? You see, as human beings, we just want to arrive at our destination. God has said, I will build a multimillionaire company. So I want it built now. God has said, I will pastor a mega church. I want it to happen now. But you see, God is very interested. He wants us to get there. He's interested in the destination, but he's also interested in the becoming, in the process it takes us to get there. He's interested in making us while we are on our way to purpose. Jesus said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you. God is still making us. And you see, that's the reason behind many of these pains, if not all of them. That's the reason behind these pains. You see, when we go through these pains, the pain of shame, the pain of offense, the pain of aloneness, you learn some things. First thing that I want us to take note of that happens to us through this pain is that the fruit of the Spirit is worked in us. The fruit of the Spirit is worked in us. As you are going through all these pains, aloneness, the shame, that one in particular, the waiting, joy, peace, love, gentleness, kindness, those things are being formed in us. Those things are being formed in us. So if you are wondering why does God let us go through this pain, it's a making process. He's working the fruit of the Spirit in us. He's working the fruit of the Spirit in us. The second reason why we go through this pain is that God is increasing your capacity and preparing you for the place of destiny. God is increasing your capacity. You see, as you are going through this, working with different people, as you learn to labor in prayer, you take ownership, you realize there is only God that you can depend on. You don't know it because it's subtle, but you are changing. You are changing on the inside, such that by the time you arrive at the destination, it's the best version of yourself that gets there. You are not the same person that started the journey that arrives there. God has molded, he has worked the fruit of the spirit, maturity of heart and mind, humility, graciousness, everything has now become a part of you such that you are able to now undo that purpose that you've bettered well so that you don't make a mess of it. That is the reason for the pain. So that you can bet the fruit of the spirit, so that you can increase our capacity to receive from him through the pain, we evolve and become the person he always had in mind when he created us. The third reason why we have to bear this pain is that through it, we learn total dependence on God. You see, when you've gone through different kinds of things, you've gone through aloneness, you've taken on that, you just know that it's only God that I need. You understand that it's only God that will not leave you nor forsake you. And in the final analysis, it's only God that you really truly need. If everything should come crashing down today, as far as you have God, you will build it up again. And this is, the, this is what the Bible was trying to express in Micah 7, 8. Micah 7, 8. Can I have it, please? You see, you, you will just know that. Just like Job, you'll be able to come from Job. At, at the end of his child, Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Meaning I've been hearing of you. But now my eye sees you. So Job has moved from the place of just knowing about God to knowing God. That is what those pains does to us. Micah 7 is, do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Simply saying that no matter what comes my way, all I truly need is the Lord. If I fall, by God I'll rise again. If I find myself in darkness, by God, it will be my light. I'll come out of it. After going through all these pains, you come to a place of total dependence. You fully understand that it's only God that I truly need. 
I'm not discounting the place of friends and family. Fantastic. But you see, God first. God most importantly. Hallelujah. I don't know if there's anybody going through these pains right now. The pain of aloneness, the pain of shame, the pain of prayer. That one is something you have to take on by yourself. It's not going to just fall on you, the pain of prayer. But if you have purpose, if you are going somewhere, you need to pray. You just need to learn to pray. Now, if we are on this journey, going through these pains, going through this journey to purpose, there are some things we ought to do. And I would just like to list a few of them. The first is we need to let patience have its perfect work. So God has said, this is where you are going, but you are still here. It is not looking like it's what is really going on. Let patience have a perfect work. As we said earlier, patience is waiting gracefully. Waiting with trust in your heart. Just trusting in God that he is able to bring it to pass. If he said it, he will do it. And he that believes will not be in haste. You are going on the journey of purpose. You are passing through these pains. Always, always remember to let patience have a perfect work. Second thing we need to do is to keep our gaze on Jesus. Looking onto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It is only by Jesus you are able to run that race with patience. That's what that verse continues with. I've always thought about that paradox. You are running with patience. It's only by God you can do that. And you see, the race of life, we have to run it with patience. The only way this can be achieved is to keep your gaze on Jesus. Keep your gaze on Jesus. If Peter had kept his eyes on Jesus and he didn't look to the waves, he would have walked on water successfully. We just have to keep our gaze fixed on Jesus. In this journey of purpose and destiny, keep your gaze on Jesus. The third point is never lose your joy. Never ever lose your joy. This one is <laughs> it's, it's easier said than done, but you see, by God, you do valiantly. The Spirit in us empowers us to do all things. Never lose your joy. Life, by its very nature, can be so complicated. Things can just come your way, unplanned things, but as a child of God, you have to choose to never lose your joy. You see, the children of Israel, it was uh, not keeping their joy that made their journey long. Instead of being joyful and just going the way God said go, they kept murmuring. 40 days became 40 years. Never lose your joy. Even in the face of trials and everything that comes your way, just, God, I don't really understand this, but I choose joy. I choose joy. I trust in you. I know that you will not leave me or forsake me. I know that you are for me. I know you love me with an everlasting love. If I cannot trust anything, I trust in your love. I know that your love is not going anywhere. Your love will carry me. Always, always choose joy. Never lose your joy. Maintain praise. Maintain your praise to God. Keep the praise of God on your lips. In the good times, praise him. In the bad times, praise him. Praise him. You see, something happens when you praise. Even you, you are lifted. Suddenly, those, those weights don't look as heavy as they are anymore. Because praise takes our gaze to God. And so, whatever you focus on will become larger in your sight. So, when you were focusing on the problem, it looked insurmountable. But the moment you got into praise and your gaze was, became fixed on God, the problem suddenly looked manageable. Like, I can get past this. Always maintain your praise. In this journey, maintain your praise. The fifth point is that we should stay in prayers and the word. I think I already said that when I was listing the pains, the pain of prayer. We have to stay in prayer. Nothing worthwhile is achieved without a birthing, without a traveling. You have to travel in prayers. You have to pray. Nobody can do it on your behalf. It's good. We have praying parents. I thank God for that. But you see, you have to pray for yourself. It is your own. Own it. It is your life. This is your life. My life began to change when I, I, I was, I think I was seeking admission. The day I just suddenly realized that this is my life is my own. And anything I do, it is mine. 
This one that my mom is following me from school to school looking for admission. She's just being a good parent, but in the final analysis, she's not the one that will go to school. It's mine. No? I have to take ownership of this, my life. When you come to that realization, you do things differently. Stay in prayers and the word of God. The word of God. We cannot just maintain, we've said that we should maintain prayers, maintain joy. You can't do it by a mental confession. Just say, I have joy. I have. There has to be a source to what you are saying. And the only source that can stand the test of anything is the word of God. It's the word of God. Stay in the word. We have to stay in the word. You want to bet purpose, you want to fulfill destiny, stay in the word. And last, but definitely not, not the least, listen to and obey God's instructions. Listen to and obey God's instructions. I found a new favorite prayer this week. I don't even know how the Holy Spirit gave me that prayer. It's, Lord, I'm listening. So I'm in the middle of the work day, I'm just doing things, and then I'll just be like, Lord, I'm listening. In case there's anything you want to tell me, Lord, I'm listening. Say it, I don't know how many times by day, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, I'm listening. Because you have to be in tune with God. You see, one instruction from God can save so much heartache and delay, and you have to be in tune with God. Just like Mary said to those servants at Cana of Galilee, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's how to bet purpose. That is how to bet a vision. Despising all the pain, enduring all the pain. This way is how you do it. That is how you bet purpose. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads as we talk to God. <laughs> Just talk to God. He knows the pains you are going through, but he's upper father. So you can still listen them to him. Lord, you see me. You know that right now I'm going through the pain of shame. I'm going through the pain of aloneness. Lord, help me. Lord, help me to take on the pain of ownership and the pain of prayers. Because this vision, this precious vision you've committed into my hand has to come to fruition. Help me to take on that pain of, of prayers. To take on that burden of prayers. To own it. To take on the burden of ownership. Help me to realize that it is mine. It is mine to walk out. It is mine. Help me to turn away from man and just face you completely. Are we praying? Are we talking to God? Are we expressing ourselves to him? Are we opening our hearts and our minds, just listing the pain to him? And you see, if Jesus was able to go through the pain successfully, there's no reason why we can't. Because he is with us. Greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. By God we do valiantly. There's nothing that comes our way that we cannot face by our God. I take on the pain of prayers, Lord. I will pray. I will pray. I will agree with you concerning this vision and purpose. I will stand and talk to the enemy at the gates. I will say no to the devil and yes to the counsel of the Lord concerning my purpose. It shall be as it was told me of the Lord. I believe and I'm going to pray it to pass. Are we talking to God? <laughs>